Tanager Place and the Meraki Institute of Learning proudly present Together We Rise, a series on capturing the journeys of resilience and well-being based on the RISE Wellness and Resilience Framework. For those of you who are joining us today for the first time, this show is a series digging deep into the concept of resilience. In this interview series, we are talking to those in the corridor who have exhibited courage and strength in the face of hardship. These individuals are here with us to share their personal story of resilience. We hope this series will inspire hope and possibility in others. Because when we call on our courage and show up in the midst of struggle, we offer a bright place and to not give up. Together we can rise, rise with the means to manage, restore, and grow. Welcome, Emily. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this interview series. Emily, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is Emily Bloom. I am the CEO at Foundation Two Crisis Services. I also am a proud uh, parent of three adultish, adulting um, kids who are 19, 20, and 23. Yeah. Um, I um, am married. My partner is an attorney um, who does court appointed and criminal defense work. And I am an avid runner and backpacker. Yes. And I am typically powered by plants sunshine and coffee. <laughs> I'm with you on the coffee. <laughs> so if I didn't have coffee, I'm not sure I would make it on a regular basis. Don't test me, but yeah. I'm not sure I would. Well, Emily, I just want to thank you for being a part of this series. You know, one of the things we really wanted to do is, is look at the journeys of different people in the corridor who I believe have exhibited tremendous amount of resilience and, and courage and wellness in the midst of some adversity throughout their life. And you have been open about your story. And one huge part of your story that I feel so humbled by is your journey through therapy and, and looking at healing some of that past trauma in the deep work that takes. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey and some of those adversities and struggles and then who you are now sitting in front of us today, cultivating that daily resilience and wellness? Um, well, I'm honored that you thought of me as a resilient um, person in the community. So I, I was raised in Colorado, and um, I um, had a lot of energy. Um, <laughs> I still have a lot of energy. Anyone who knows me knows that. Um, and uh, when I was young, um, my parents uh, put me into gymnastics. I, I was raised in an intact family. I, my mom and my dad were married. I have an older sister. Um, and I think they were just trying to figure out what to do with me. So I started that journey of gymnastics, which was great. And then when I was in the third grade, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. He had been drafted into Vietnam. He had been exposed to Agent Orange. And um, he ended up dying while I was a senior in high school. Around the same time, I ended up um, getting injured in gymnastics. I was very good mm -hmm. and um, ended up going into um, the doctor's office on a Friday and then I had surgery on a Monday and, you know, was told, like, you'll never, you'll never do gymnastics again. Mm -hmm. So I felt like in a really short period of time, like essentially I felt like the world kind of broke me. Yeah. Um, both of those things were my entire world. And so... I began to try to feel so anything other than like this horrible, what felt at the time like suffering yes. um, and sadness. And so um, I embarked kind of on my own journey of risk taking. I joke with my kids now that uh, my extracurricular activity in high school was <laughs> risk taking. <laughs> I was very good at it. Um, but, you know, extensive uh, drug and alcohol um, You, I've been pretty public about I got pregnant in high school and ended up uh, terminating a pregnancy, um, which I was, was grateful I had that option. Um, and then I, um, I'd, I'd wanted to go to college, but, you know, I felt like I was probably, um, 
I didn't think I would do well in college. Yeah. And then a friend of mine said, you know, if you if you go to college, you can live in the dorms and you don't have a curfew. And I was like, <laughs> sign me up. Sold. <laughs> so I applied to our uh, Colorado State, which was the college in my hometown, um, the last day I possibly could. And I was accepted and um, really decided to kind of start over, um, start over in college. Wow. Emily, then you kind of arrive to this place, you know, as an adult and, and getting through college and, and embarking on your career and found yourself in a extreme success and leadership. And, and tell me kind of a little bit about that journey that has led you to being the CEO of Foundation 2. I think that as I was going through all of those difficult times, I didn't want to experience the badness of those situations, especially when I was younger, like feeling the badness of situations and the sadness and uh, experiencing trauma for what it really was, was something that I just did not want. So I did everything I could to, to not look at that. And the older I got and the more I kind of came into who I was, I started to understand that it was those life experiences uh, that, you know, that really made me who I am. And it sounds like somewhat of a cliche, but it's those things that break you, the things that broke me that really um, helped me kind of sort through the difficulty of, um, of those challenges and to find some appreciation yeah. for those experiences, which I don't think is easy to do. Yeah. I do not, I mean, I and I think it's taken a lot of work to be able to look back at those and have gratitude for pain and suffering in my life. Yeah, because at the time it certainly doesn't feel like, I'm so thankful I'm going through oh, these God. hard things. No. <laughs> you know, it's just this desire to escape those hard things. But one of the things that resonates so much with me about kind of your story and your journey is then this moment in which you came to this place of saying, you know, I need to do some healing around this to cultivate the best pieces of who I want to be, to show up in this world and be living fully present. I have to do some work. Yeah. I have to deal with some pain. It you was know? horrible. I mean, it was... It was exhaust, and it still is exhausting work. The journey to better yourself and and be who you want to be, I think, is exhausting work, no matter what your life experiences are. Yeah. Um, for me, there came a point where I realized that if I didn't do the work, like my quality of life was not going to be what I wanted it to be, and so I feel like I put in so much time and effort into doing the work. And I needed someone to help me do that work. Like, yeah. I think it's really difficult to, to do that work yourself. Even I, I'm a really introspective person. Yeah. I, um, I'm a really candid person. Um, I'll own my stuff. And I had to have someone who was willing to to help me kind of put the parts and pieces of my life together in a way that made sense for me. Yeah. A lot of people talk about that therapeutic journey as being one of the hardest journeys they've ever taken. In a lot of ways, because when you're sitting there exposed and vulnerable with a therapist, you're opening up the wounds that for a while you may have tried to shove aside or fill or do things to avoid. And you are now opening that back up in just a hope that it moves you to a better place. But there requires this level of faith around that. Tell yeah, there's me no how, guarantee. <laughs> tell me how you got through that journey. There were a couple of things that I think were really important. One of them was um, a commitment to the work. Like, I don't know what I'm going to look like on the other side of this, but I can't continue to be who I am and where I am yeah. broken here. Um, I think there was a belief that I had to remind myself that I was capable of doing the hard work. Often we tell ourselves like um, that we're not worthy of the hard work or that it's uh, going to be more time and effort than we're willing to put in. And it took a lot of self-talk and kind of the dialogue in my head to say like, you are worth the work. Make this a priority in your life if you want to get to a point where you can value those difficult experiences and then use those to help be transformative in the lives of other people. Yeah. 
But so much of therapy is not just an isolated journey, no. right? And I think, you know, I've heard you talk about so much of the desire to go on this healing journey and this transformation was also to enhance the relationships you had, you know, to that you needed to be whole in order to experience relationships in, in, in a way that you felt like you needed to experience them. And I've heard you say how much your village got you through. <laughs> oh, I mean, the people that have shown up for me in my life, it's... It's absolutely incredible because it was unexpected for me. Like when you realize who's willing to show up for you or you can ask people to show up for you, which is incredibly difficult to do, to so say like, difficult. oh my God, Tanya, like I really need you to show up for me and, and learning to ask for what you need, to trust that people will actually be there even if you're not your best self, even if you're not who you want to be, even if you're only partially who you are and you're like on the way to being you know, a whole human, yeah. um, you know, there were a lot of people that showed up for me and, you know, my therapist is only one of them, yeah. <laughs> but surrounding yourself with people where you can be your authentic self and know that those people aren't like they're, they're real, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know how else to say it other than like that relationship is a real relationship yeah. and that doesn't mean it's a permanent relationship but it means that it is one of great value. Um, and I had people that showed up for me when I didn't expect it. And I have people who showed up for me at times in my life and now they're not a yeah. part of my life. And that's okay too. Because yeah. what you needed from them in that moment was exactly the right thing. Oh, yeah. And that doesn't mean that maybe it lasts forever, but it was exactly what you needed then. Absolutely. In the RISE framework, we talk so deeply about relationships and about, you know, we talk about something in there called the you intervention. And that's this exploration of who we are and what we need and our preferences. One of the key things is then how we communicate those to the people we love, which is hard because we approach sometimes relationships like if you really cared about me, you would just know what I oh, need. <laughs> read my, Tanya, read my mind. <laughs> You know what's in my head. You know what yeah. I, or or you know me well enough to know. You should know. Yeah, yeah. And then we're left disappointed and more sad and more lonely and more feeling unworthy. Um, so what advice would you give to people who are scared to just put out there what they need and take that vulnerable step? How did you combat some of those negative narratives well, I, I still struggle with it. It's not like I did the work and now I'm good. Um, there, there are a couple things. One, um, I think that the creating a relationship that's safe with myself was the most important thing that I did. And I like got giving yourself like grace and love um, type of like knowing that I'm okay and mm. I'm safe all by myself. The value of other people yeah. in my life is critical, but that I am worthy and capable of any effort and need of my own that I'm able to meet yes. and that I, um, I can ask for what I need, but if I don't get that from someone, I'm still okay with who I am by yeah. myself. And, and that is a lot of the work that I did in therapy. Um, so I, I think that that's one piece of it. You know, Emily, when talking about or thinking about this idea of being okay by yourself, right? So often as women, we have such preconceived notions and societal standards of who we are as women, right? One that we have to be and do all things for others. Another is, you know, who we are in relationship to our husbands, to our children, that this concept of like, I'm okay by myself and I can have a village. I don't have to always just be someone else's village. How did you navigate some of that? As to me, one of you know the strongest female you know people that I admire. Um, well, it definitely is something I keep working on. Um, there is a lot to be said for um, learning that you're okay on your own. Um, I think that. There was so much time, especially early in my career, when I relied on what other people thought about me rather than what I inherently knew about myself. Yes. And uh, that, a lot of that comes goes back to like gymnastics stuff, body image stuff, yes. um, you know, 
my self-worth was based on what someone else thought of me, what someone else told me they thought of me, um, things that I tolerated, especially early in my career, that I just wouldn't now because yes. I am so much more aware of who I am, my own value, um, without someone having to tell me what that is. Yeah. But I do think that often we label ourselves as a mother or um, a, you know, a, a strong female leader, which, which I believe I am. I absolutely believe that. Um, but, but the work around that is like, I want to be viewed as, as, um, as a strong leader generally, not because I'm a female, right? Or a good parent, not just because I'm a mom and I'm our, the CEO of our house, you know, for many years that like was a planner or just the ways that um, people talk about women, what society tells us about women. You know, it's my nature as a feminist really to fight back and push back uh, about those expectations. Yeah. I love so much you sharing this and talking about this because it takes me back to one of the experiences that you had early on in adolescence and that was the termination of a pregnancy. Yeah. And I remember in the pre-interview talking to you about what that experience was like for you in a society where sometimes the dominant view around that still is that it is a secretive thing. It's rooted in shame. You don't talk about it. And what that leaves for women who decide that is the best interest of what they need in that moment. Tell me about that experience for you and what you would say to other females who have either had that or had struggled with making that decision. You know, for me, it was an easy decision. And when I say easy, it doesn't mean the process was easy. Absolutely. What it means is that I knew enough about myself, what I wanted long-term. Um, I knew enough about the relationship that I was in. I knew how I got to that point, And um, I knew that it was the right decision for me. Um, that being said, I didn't tell anybody. I mean, my mother didn't know. At the time, I was working at a fast food restaurant and a, a, a wonderful woman who was the manager of that restaurant took me, paid for it, and it's heartbreaking to me that I don't even remember her name, but it has been a constant reminder to me of how things that seem really small to us can have a huge benefit to other people. And it's partly because of that experience that I, I fully um, take on that philosophy that doing really small things for people um, that seem small to us can just be absolutely life-changing for other people. And she, and she was. You know, I didn't share that because of shame at the time. Um, but there are so many parts of our lives where we um, attribute shame. And if we were just all honest about our life experiences, you know, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be shame. I mean, I'm not the only woman yeah. who's ever terminated a pregnancy. And, um, and I know that it is a highly uh, controversial and divisive uh, subject. And I am so much more than that. I am, I'm a good mother, mm -hmm. I'm a good leader, I'm a good partner, I'm a good, um, I, I mean, there's so many other parts of me. Yeah. And it is because of that experience and the experiences, other experiences that I've had in my life that has made me all of those good things. Yeah. Um, I love so much that you share that because in the RISE framework, one of the core pieces is social emotional development. And to me, your experiences and your journey to this point has been centered around what I believe is cultivating your own emotional intelligence and how to lead from a place of emotional intelligence, how to lead from a place of self-awareness and perspective taking and relationships come first. Always. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, you know, it's so I did direct service for many, many years before I became a CEO. And I decided to be a CEO because the work I was in was really difficult. It was exhausting. I lost a marriage over the difficulty of the work. I would come home at the end of the day and I had no energy left for my, for my relationship um, with my then husband. I was a I wasn't a very good mom at the time. Um, and I decided that I wanted to be an administrator that supported our teams that do difficult work. Mm -hmm. And so 
um, one of the best ways to do that, I think, is to, to own your stuff and lead from a place of empathy. One of the most difficult times in my life was actually leading through the pandemic. I mean, yeah. we're an organization that does crisis mental health services, and the pandemic has been so detrimental to the mental health of people mm -hmm. in our community, but across the state and across the world. And our teams were supporting the mental health of the community. Yeah. And I was so concerned about them. I wanted them to be whole enough to be able to serve other people. I wanted our leadership team to be whole enough to support our teams who were supporting these people. <laughs> and the decision making, which felt like it was changing constantly, um, it was it was incredibly difficult. Um, but leading from a place of empathy, leading from a place of vulnerability, um, being able to tell, I mean, I sent out emails to our entire team of 140 saying, I am not well today. This is hard. My decision making is not on point. I need someone else to, to help me with this. I've increased my therapy because I need more than what I was getting to be able to be the best in this role and to be the person that I want to be. I upped my medication. Yeah. I have been really public about the fact that, you know, medication has been a key to me being as well as I am. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that I have been able to find, you know, a kind of a cocktail of a variety of meds plus talk therapy, plus um, yeah. relationships and um, to kind of put my life together in a way that makes sense for me. Yeah. So often when we connect, when we feel a sense of belonging in relation to our struggles or the things we need, when we feel a sense of safety to be open and honest and vulnerable, our wellness and our resilience is so much more cultivated. How, how would you describe your ability to do that? I think you do it in small doses. I think you you um, you share what you're comfortable at in the moment, knowing that your life experiences can better other people. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's been something that has been um, really therapeutic for me in my own healing journey, is that when I share a, a personal situation that I'm in or I share a personal struggle, it's like you instantly create a safe space for someone else to share theirs. Mm -hmm when I disclosed that I had an abortion, you know, I have other women or, or other people acknowledge, like, I'm so glad you said that. Like, that happened to me too. I thought I was alone yes. and I know I'm not. By owning our own stuff and being in a place where we can be vulnerable and share that, we're instantly creating the villages that we, that we want and need to be our best selves. Yeah. And I love so much when you talk about that it, then also gives you a sense of meaning and purpose. It helps you identify, you know, I've been through struggles and hard things and I can take those things to not only be the better version of myself because I've made it through it, because I'm capable to, because I was courageous, because I was brave, because I have done hard work, but I can also then show others that their life matters and that they can do it too. I mean, Trying to be a role model in, in vulnerability um, is something that I never would have thought um, when I was younger, early in my career. Like, you know, I was so consumed by what people thought of me. Um, and being able to work through that through the years, I mean, literally years that it took, um, has really helped me get to this place where. Um, I am so okay with who I am. I mean, you know, it's it's not. I mean, you can look at. I I have tons of tattoos, right? <laughs> I I have a lot of tattoos, and and there was so much time where I covered those up and hid them because I was so afraid of what people thought about me. And it is so, um, it is so refreshing for me, and it is so empowering for me to be able to know who I am and authentically show up as who I am and know that not everybody's going to like me and people will judge me. Yeah. And that is them, that is on them, that is not on me. Yeah. And I, I am not responsible for what other people think about me, but I am responsible for doing the work so I show up 
authentically as who I am and that I'm good with that. Yeah, I love it. Emily, last piece of, of advice for those who are listening, to those who maybe had similar struggles as you or, you know, <laughs> it's no understatement to say that there is probably many, many women who are watching this and, and nodding their heads at you who have felt very similar walking through this world to being a woman. Last pieces of advice that you would give. You're worthy of the work. So whatever that looks like for you, you are absolutely worthy of putting in the time and effort to figure out who you are, to make yourself better. To, um, and, and that may mean doing hard things. That may mean changing your job, leaving a relationship. Um, it, w whatever that looks like for you, like you are worthy of it. Um, and there's value in the difficult experiences that you've gone through to get to where you're going. Yeah. And you're worthy of saying no to someone else and yes to yourself. Yeah, gosh, it is a it's a constant battle, but you are absolutely yes. right. Um, and I think that the other piece is that um, showing up as you are, whoever you are, um, there's value in that as well. And um, you know, putting time and effort in to figure out your stuff and owning your stuff, good and bad, um, and then knowing that every opportunity you have to, um, if you take opportunities to help other women, um, there's great value in that because that's what helps build that village. Yeah. Share your stuff, um, celebrate women, celebrate the women in your, you know, you can call it a tribe, you can call it a village, yeah. um, but the people that show up for you, it, um, I mean, they're just critical to your overall well-being. Yeah. Emily, thank you so, so much. Your voice matters. Um, I appreciate so deeply you sharing your story, um, sharing that journey, because I think for so many, it can be one of inspiration of hope. And so thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Support is out there. You're okay. Just how you are. The staff members and the people that I met along the way just made me realize that there are genuine people out there that actually just want to help. Reach out to somebody. It's okay to literally not be okay. As somebody in your corner, how do you become your best self for others if you're not doing that for yourself first? I was rescued. I am who I am, but I will never be able to be the part of somebody else. We all want to be heard. We all want to be felt like we matter and we all want to be loved. That, that's universal. Life choices I made may be the reason that I'm having a harder time and not feeling shame in that. No matter the challenges you and your family face, Tanager Place is here for you. We'll meet you wherever you are in your journey and together define a path to reach your goals. Together we rise. Tanager Place. Thank you again for joining us today and for spending time with us. We hope today's segment offered hope and healing. Today's series brought to you by Tanager Place and the Meraki Institute of Learning. For more information, please visit our website.